Hello, everyone. Welcome to NB Geese Let's Talk 10 Forward Live, our Sunday stream, History of Film. And for those of you who thought we just meant movie film, no, no, no. Just see, folks, for those of you who don't know, there was this little thing called VHS and cassette tapes back in the day that were also film. So film has many different areas. So we are going to talk about uh, just a little bit uh, because this is way too broad to do in a small frame of time. Star Trek. Yes, folks, I know. You probably heard Star Trek talked about, ooh, I don't know, 50 million times. Well, guess what? You're getting it again. Because Yay. this is what, this is a great thing. This is the, There's a reason why this is out there. This is a reason why it's not just a TV show. It's not just a movie. There are reasons why when people say that, it's kind of like you want to smack them upside the head and like, are you an idiot? <laughs> you have movies, you have TV shows, and then you have things that just define pop culture. But before we get into that, let me introduce my, my co-host, my wonderful co-host here to my right because I hate way that does that with the mic. Yeah, exactly. The man who makes Trader Trolls cry and mops the floors with their tears, all the way from California, Jack Beers! Boom! Woo! What's up? What's going and on? Is, and all the way from the other side. So, folks, you may not realize this, but you have an interesting panel here. Uh, you have West Coast, East Coast, Mid Midwestern right here because I live in Indiana. So also we have from the New England area of Maryland. She's strong. She's independent. She thinks for herself. She stands for. She's what third wave feminists hate because she will not take a knee for them and stand on her own morals and values. Alicia A V P. Hey everybody. So, so basically, we're going to talk about history of film. We're talking about Star Trek. Um, I think Star Trek in America, and I'm, I'm going to kind of start this one off real quick, is kind of our equivalent to British's Doctor Who. Doctor Who obviously came out before it. But yes. when you think of science fiction, Star Trek really is the one that got people. To just, you know, and it didn't happen right away. It happened in syndication later, but we'll get into that. And I, I think that one of the things I, I thought was interesting is we have to, you know, recognize the woman who saved Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Lucille Ball. Yep. Which I know there are a lot of people who still don't know that because they don't wait until the end of the credits. It, it was her. In fact, I found out, I was just looking at this. She created the first independent TV company. Yes. Desi Lou. Yeah, Desi Lou. Mm -hmm. And she. Um, with with Desi Arnaz, of course. So CBS passed on it. NBC did the pilot for The Cage, rejected it, but CBS gave it another call. And all her board of directors basically rejected this and she vetoed them. So, folks, you you can think, you know what? I will always say it. I love Lucy. You, you, you can't not. It, it, and also, one of the things we have to remember, too, is these people actually had to put quality to their stories. Because back then, I, I was looking this up. In 1967, there are three TV stations, ABC, CBS, NBC. I mean, that's it. So you, you have three people competing against each other at that time versus I don't even know what we have now. I don't even think we could put a gambit to it. I, I mean, I mean, for me, it'd be like going from IP4 to IP6. Yeah. So um, for you guys, uh, give you a little history of me when it came to Star Trek. Um, Star Wars, for example, I got into really got into when I was about 14, 15. So when the prequels came out, uh, I was very fresh into the fandom. 
So I didn't have all that, those years of other things to go with it to kind of deal with that, you know, issue a lot of people have with the prequels. Uh, Star Trek, ironically, the first episode I saw was Encounter at Farpoint. Star Trek, we, I was in West Virginia. Star Trek, the next generation was coming out. This was a big deal in my house. My grandmother was a huge Star Trek fan. And by when I say that, it, I'll get to the point of that one. If you, for those of you who don't know the story, some of you do. We watched it. We watched the counter at Farpoint. Okay, I enjoyed it. This was something new to me. My grandfather was not a sci-fi fan, so he couldn't really care less. My dad liked it. My grandmother couldn't stand Picard, so she literally she goes, "Jess, come here." It's like, okay. Takes me downstairs to the basement uh, of the house in Granite City where her, um, basically her movie theater room was, for lack of a better term. And grabs Star Trek Episode One VHS, um, where no man has gone before, and says, let me show you a real Star Trek captain. That was my, that, that was my uh, introduction to Star Trek okay. in 1986. Yeah, mine mine was um, it, I had seen the movies. Uh, I'm not sure which one. It was either Wrath of Khan or um, Search for Spock. One of those two. Um, and then I started watching it on TV. But um, it, like I like it was Next Generation stuff I first saw on TV as well. And I was like, "Where's Kirk? <laughs> what happened to Kirk and Spock?" But um. You know, and then and then I found out later on that you know the, the two shows were separate, but you know of the same continuity. Uh, and I and I started watching them more and more, and just really liking them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Alicia? My sci-fi journey actually started when I was still inside my mom. So my mom introduced me to the movie Dune in 1984, where she was pregnant with me. And Long my- live the fighters! <laughs> yep <clears throat> the spice and my dad introduced me to star trek and star wars at the same time when i was about three or four so i got both of them at the same time simultaneously and it just merged together and yeah i've been a sci-fi fit- fan all my life i have no excuse <laughs> hey, Kat, my introduction to star trek was the motion picture fell asleep as a kid in theater thankfully <laughs> i can I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, PCAT. I, I always felt the first Star Trek movie was more 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I have to be honest, I know it's a great film, but it's boring as hell. <laughs> it, it just is boring. I, I find it boring as hell. So, I mean, we all grew up at different iterations of, you know, how Star Trek developed. But I mean, you know, we ha- we have to go into the fact that this was a pitched idea that Gene Roddenberry did based on his military experience. That's why, you know, because he was a Navy aviator, if I'm not mistaken, Air Force, uh, Army, Air- Army Air Corps, Army Air Actually. Corps. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. Army Air Corps was prior to the Air Force. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. During World War II. Yes. And he took that idea and merged it with this, and you know, created that whole thing of wagon train in space. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, I don't know if that's exactly the right word I would have used at the time. I would say more this was sailing the high seas in space, exploration, just in space versus, you know, on a ship or something or going across. Maybe that's what he meant by wagon train. I don't know. It, it just, you know, but I mean, Lucille Ball, vetoed, I mean, if the board of directors had a way, there'd be no Star Trek. There'd have been two pilots and that would have been it. That's all we would ever got in Star Trek. And if we didn't have Star Trek, there's so many things we wouldn't have. For for a lot of us growing up, one of the things why I say Star Trek is not just you know a TV show is because I know so many people throughout my life who were inspired by it. I became an IT guy because of Star Trek. I knew people became doctors, engineers, pilots, 
you know, you name it. I knew people who were, they were like, yeah, it was Star Trek that inspired me. I mean, whether it was they were born with it, um, they watched it later, but really what got people was a syndication. And then, you know, you hear about when they, they had their first convention and they, you know, they kind of thought it was funny that, you know, you'll hear William Shatner say he didn't think anybody show up and the place was just filled. <laughs> and he was shocked. They, they were really generally shocked at how, I mean, you got to remember, this is, you know, we're talking 70s time. We don't have internet. We don't have all the social media stuff. I mean, for these people to find it, hey, there's a Star Trek invasion <clears throat> and all these people show up. I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if it was a little overwhelming at times to see how inspirational the characters were. I mean, I, I'm sure we all know um, uh, Nichelle Nichols, you know, saying that the reason why she stayed on uh, Star Trek as she was planning on leaving was because of who? Dr. King. Dr. Mark, yeah, Dr. King. King. Yeah, you're, you're totally like going over our, what we're about to talk about like yeah all right all right uh, <laughs> at least yeah you start because i i know this is well, one history area we definitely know very well so at least yeah, you start okay so i'm gonna start with um we're not going in technically chronological order so i'm gonna start you with don't have to. animated series so that actually ran from 1973 to 1974 and there was only 22 episodes and it's still canon so yes, <laughs> and it had a budget of seventy-five. Let me see, yeah, seventy-five thousand dollars per episode, and all of the original cast appeared in the series except for Chekhov. And the only series, this is the only series of the Star Trek franchise that has never had a teaser with it. Yep, that's well, it. Well, Walter Kanan did direct one episode, and yes, he did. He did do that. Yes. <clears throat> So, yeah, but like I said, they changed it a little bit. But like I said, that was the only character that did not appear in the animated series was Walter Cohen. He did not appear in that one at all. So poor Chekhov. Sorry, Chekhov. Hey, let's remember he was the one who showed up in season two and three. So exactly. Exactly. You know, I mean, you're talking a budget. And even at that time, these guys were still I mean, that's a big cast of people to bring in. It is. It is. But um, I always view this, I don't care what anybody says, this is basically season four. Yes. And also, this was the one that introduced us to the original captain of the Enterprise. Not Pike, but this is the one that introduced us to Admiral Robert April. Yes. Yes. Yep. So next is going to be the TNG series. That aired from September 28, 1987 to May 23, 1994. There was 178 episodes over seven seasons, and it cost $1.3 million per episode. And by season five, it actually reached 12 million viewers, actually. and 12 million viewers, that's a lot. That is, especially for that era, when you think about it, too. Well, we got to remember, too, to, to let everybody know, we are talking the era before mainstream cable. I mean, the 80s were really, you know, when cable kind of came around, but it wasn't exactly something that was affordable to a lot of people. And there weren't a whole Cable lot was new. Yeah, yeah cable was, was new. new. I mean, yeah, the first satellite, I believe, was launched in 1977. Yep. And the internet is just starting off at this era. So, yes. And there's no thing of spoilers, message boards. No, it's just. And and before that, you uh, the way you would get your uh, the way you would get your 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 TV show from another part of the country, you got it. lot like physical lines that would connect to antennas that would actually connect to each other. Yep, had those. Yeah, those were the I original mean, cable, and then to... satellite cable came around 1977. Well, remember how we used to uh, go uh, before we had that scroll screen. It would tell us when stuff was coming on on cable channels. We had to watch the scroll screen. Yeah. And of course, you know, who who doesn't remember? You you walk away all of a sudden. Your 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 show. The, oh, now I gotta wait another minute for it. I remember that. Wasn't that? Yes. I, was that channel ninety nine or was that the Spice Channel? I don't remember. I think it, it was, was channel ninety nine, but it could be. Wrong. Okay. Okay. It was, it was something like that. I know it was yeah. the Sci Fi Channel at one point. 
But we, we had uh, we had this. Uh, you know, most of us would get our stuff. Yeah, like BK dances. Yeah. We got our information from the TV Guide channel. We we you know that was a regular thing. I mean, my family didn't get it mailed to us. They would just every time we went out to the store uh, during the week, pick it up on whatever day it dropped. I don't remember what day it dropped, but. You know, TV Guide Channel would come up and, you know, they'd be like, okay, this is all. And I remember my grandmother, who was a big media person, which is why I'm into films so much. She would highlight what she wanted to watch. And it was usually Star Trek and Alfred Hitchcock stuff. <laughs> Smart lady. Smart lady. <laughs> but so yeah. Continue. So the TNG series received 19 Emmys two Hugo Awards, five Saturn Awards, and a Peabody Award. And season two had the ch certain changes that took place from season one to season two. So season two, Beverly Crusher was replaced by Pulaski. And mm. I know, I don't like her either. And also 10 Forward was introduced that season as well. As well Yay! As <laughs> Isn't that when, yeah, w did Guinan show up in season two or is that season three? Season two. Oh, season two. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, they, I think they specifically honest, brought I'm in uh, Ken Ford for that. I, I'm, to bring in the I'm in the minority here. Yeah, on that. I'm, I'm in the minority here uh, in most Star Trek fandom. I actually liked Pulaski better. <laughs> well, I, I did. That's fair. I, I just did. But I know a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that happened and why she was not there afterwards. And right. not only that, never even mentioned again, which I thought was disrespectful. Yeah, they should have at least, yeah, you're right. Yes, exactly. They should have at least done that, yes. Yeah, going in back when Whoopi Goldberg wasn't such a... Beep, 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 Mm-hmm. But yeah, and season four is when Brandon Braga and Jerry Law joined the show, and also when the Cardassians were first introduced. Yeah, the Cardassians. Yes, Brandon Abbott. Yep. Mm -hmm. We finally got introduced to the Cardassians in season four. And well, remember, uh, remember when uh, Picard said the first time he ever actually was around Cardassians was on the Stargazer when he lowered his shields in. You know, as a sign of respect, the Cardassians opened fire, and I just literally, as a military person, at my point, I'm like. Oh my God! What were you thinking? But you get what I'm saying. It, it, you know that was an interesting point. And the guy who played the Cardassian um, Gull on that episode is the one who later became Gull Dukat. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Exactly. My favorite villain ever. <laughs> one of my favorites. Absolutely and best antagonist ever. <laughs> Yep, and there was seven fourth season. This is season four now. Season four episodes were nominated for eight Emmys. And in season six, we got a cameo by Stephen Hawking. Yep, I remember that. Yes, with that infamous poker scene with Data. I, you know, actually, I did not realize, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't realize when they said special guest star Stephen Hawkins. I was so young, I didn't know who Stephen Hawkins was at the time. So I yeah. didn't realize he was the guy in the poker scene <laughs> until I think a decade or so later. Right. Yeah, I didn't put two and two together to realize who he was when I first saw it either, so don't feel bad. Same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the lie. Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> Will Wheaton. Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> exactly. Paid by Will you Wheaton. Know, the life before Will Wheaton life hates before. that. Yeah, life before <laughs> memes. Mm -hmm. And around the same time with TNG going on, we also had D DS9, Deep Space Nine. That was the game changer. Yes, it was. And that aired from January 3rd, 1993 to June 2nd, 1999. 176 episodes over seven seasons. Now, Frank Sinatra Jr. found out that he was actually offered a role on that series at one point. So... The character of Vic Fontaine was originally supposed to be played by Frank Sinatra Jr., but nope, it went to this guy called James Doran instead. 
You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I really felt a Frank Sinatra kind of vibe with Vic Fontaine based on the air and everything. Yes. Um, and yes. I know there's a lot of people out there who say they don't like the character of Fontaine. I disagree. I think Fontaine was a really great alternate program, especially when he had to do with um, uh, the episode with Nog. What was it? It's just a paper. Uh, mm -hmm. Where he yeah, had to he, sing that same song over and over, and he was just like, yeah. come on, man, you got to get over this. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was one thing uh, DS9 did that was very unique. They, they enhanced secondary and tertiary characters. Yes. In, uh, I mean, in, uh, yeah, it's a paper moon. Thank you. He's right. It's a paper moon. That was after uh, the battle where uh, Dog lost his leg and got it replaced. But it yeah. was still, you know, one of the great things about that episode is even though he's physically healed, this was one of the few times we actually mm -hmm. he, see the mental. And as someone who knows this, knows war and stuff, right. mental health is more painful than physical health. Agreed. So, anyway, please continue. I'm sorry. I'm just throwing out, you know. No, that's totally fine. That's really fine. So there was also a DS9 documentary, What We Left what Behind. We behind. Yep. Great documentary. Great documentary. Mm -hmm. And that actually received 100% on Rotten Tomatoes by nine critics. There was also another spinoff around the same time, too. There was two spinoffs, in case you guys didn't know. Star Trek Voyager and DS9. So Voyager is the next one. That one ran from January 16th, 1995 to May 23rd, 2001. 172 episodes over seven seasons. And that was the first series to new CGI rather than the models for the exterior space shots. And that, I did not, that I did not know. I did yeah. not know that. I thought the... Was this after um, um, Star Trek uh, First Contact came out? Because I remember, I believe, I think it was in so Star Trek. It was around the same time First Contact. I'm get, I'll get to that in just a second. About the movie. Oh, okay. Right. Getting ahead of myself. <laughs> no, you're fine. So then there's also the final series of the main <laughs> Star Trek. We will not discuss the others. But the last oh, one is Star, Star Trek Enterprise. September 26, 2001 to May 13, 2005, 98 episodes over four seasons. The first three seasons, it cost $1.7 million to make per episode. And then in season four, it decreased in value to $800,000 per episode. You know, it's interesting you bring up the fact that the, the value of the shows for Enterprise uh, mm -hmm. was actually less in the 2000 era than yeah. what it cost for TNG in the 80s. Yes, it is. I know part of it was the merger when they mer merged over with Param Paramount with the UPN kind of, yeah, that just made a mess out of stuff. <laughs> I think what happened really that kind of messed up a little bit of both Voyager and Enterprise was them being syndicated on different channels. And you live in an area where like I was living and unfortunately, I didn't have UPN. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get UPN in the place I was living at those times. So for most of Voyager and Enterprise, I didn't see until I bought them. Okay. I had to watch the reruns, so that's, I missed a lot of the episodes. So yeah. I, didn't even have, I didn't even have luxury on reruns. I remember going, uh, I remember I was at a hotel. I was TDY uh, mm -hmm. in the military, and I was at a hotel. And I was turning on the TV and I was looking at the channel, uh, TV guide channel area. And uh -huh. it said on this channel, Star Trek Enterprise. And I'm like, I've never seen a Star Trek Enterprise episode. So I was like, I clicked on it. Uh -huh. And of course, you know, I knew Scott Bakula from Quantum Leap. Yes. yes. And absolutely loved Quantum Leap. Grew up on Quantum Leap. Loved it. Uh -huh. uh, so... I, I was actually impressed and I was kind of disappointed. I couldn't, this was probably going to be the only episode I was going to see at the time. I mean, this mm. was, you know, back in tw 2002 or three at the time. Yeah. I mean, now I have all of them, but I mean, yeah, that was one of the things. Syndication really helped keep Star Trek alive, but it also kind of at the end, 
with Voyager and Enterprise, I think kind of hurt it because the syndication wasn't spread out the way it should have been. It was very selective. And unfortunately, most of us were in cable at that time. And this was a cable network and not every area carried that, you know, that particular channel. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, that series, unfortunately, didn't do too well when they did a top list, when they did a, the included list back in 2016. So they did a list of all the Star Trek movies and films and stuff like that. So Enterprise, unfortunately, got 12th on that ranking. But it did do better than Generations, Star Trek Generations, the movie. <laughs> not enough faith of the heart. Nope, not enough faith of the heart. <laughs> you know, I'm one of the minorities, too, who also says, I enjoyed that opening. That was a good now, song. That was a now, good song. Now, I only, have one, I only have one issue with it now, and that was when somebody told me Rod Stewart had done that same version, had done that song. So I listened <laughs> to the Rob Stewart faith of the heart. I was like, right, now I'm screwed. But then again, I was like, Rob Stewart is like certain other people. You could just sing the phone book and you fucking listen to him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, I mean, that was literally it. Once we got to 05, so we went from 66 to 05. And that's the end of the Star Trek era. That is that is Star not Trek. Not counting the movies. Not counting the movies. The movies ran from 1979 to 2002. So, yeah. Yeah. Motion and ended with Nemesis. But you know what? Since you've got the shirt on, uh, Alicia, before we go to Jack, let's talk about why. Yes, exactly. You know where I'm going here. Let's talk about why the Oroville is universally, by Star Trek fans, considered to be the inheritor over what Paramount and CBS are doing. One, storytelling. Two, casting. Three, CGI. Four, it's the music. Music is epic. I mean, you could just like just put the di just mute it one time. Just mute it. Don't listen to the dialogue. Just listen to the music. The music just tells the story. Another reason, my boyfriend. We got introduced to this series together. <laughs> oh, how did you guys get introduced to it together? So I found it on television, network television, and then within a year or two, some troll started a rumor. Oh, Orville's canceled. I don't think so. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do a live stream to debunk it. Jack had messaged one of the producers, Tom Constantino, saying, is it canceled? What's going on? Where's the source material? Jack contacted Tom. Tom contacted Jack. Nope. There's all. That's all BS, dude. That's all BS. And me and Jack debunked it. <coughs> me About a year later, Jack and I started doing watch parties. A year later, in four months, here we are. Uh, BK Dan, I'm going to say this. Oroville is better than STD. No. Oroville is vastly STD superior to anything STD has done. One of the biggest reasons why is STD has one main freaking character who is just super god. Garbage. Garbage. Mm -hmm. Oroville. Yay. Yep. Exactly. But one of the things, too, was it, you know, I always kind of talk with people and we said, you know, we kind of had this fun joke, we would say. And I don't know if you've heard me say it, but we kind of called it uh, Oroville as Star Trek without the stick shoved up their ass. <laughs> yeah, I've heard sure. that. Yeah, definitely. Yes. What I thought about Vo what I thought about Oroville, the very first couple episodes was I think people I, I think Seth MacFarlane pitched this really well they you know people are thinking okay this is a guy from family guy the guy who's done um the cleveland show you know he does these vulgar things this is going to be a parody of star trek and yes the first couple episodes it's kind of you know the the humor is a little in your face mm -hmm. but then you notice throughout the, the the first season and then in the second season the humor becomes more organic more natural. And I think that he did that on purpose to kind of be like, okay, this is how I'm going to get the show on the air, but you know, this is how I'm going to keep it alive. Yes. Cause he's a fan of star Trek in any way. Cause he had appeared on star Trek enterprise. Believe it or yes, not. Yes, he did. I remember when uh, the guy who played commander Tucker, Ensign Rivers, 
Yeah, I remember when he said, it's nice to see one of my engineers get promoted. And uh, I would love to see the guy who played uh, played Trip to be on an episode of Orville. I think that would just be icing on the cake. Yes, definitely, definitely. But yes, Orville is going to always have a special place for me because I've interviewed many of them, the cast and crew. Me and Jack have talked to Jay Lee, one of the main cast members. He knows who we are. So yeah. Orville, Orville's the best. <laughs> uh, so, Jack, did he ever buy you the beer or give you the beer money? <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Jack showed me that. I mean, he told me about it, and then I was like, I bet yeah. you better. I was like, you better post the damn video. <laughs> oh, no, for the, are yeah, we talking no, about Kevin Jack, Smith? I will not buy you beer. <laughs> oh, no, no. We're talking about, we're talking about P uh, Peter. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't. Yeah, yeah. No, Jack. I will not buy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I asked him to say that. So. <laughs> oh, you did, huh? No, but yeah. that was really funny. Uh, but what I've noticed is when you look at the characters of Oroville, um, they're more what I would call, like I said, it, it. I mean, it embodies the spirit of Star Trek without having to be Star Trek. It's his own entity. But it, most Star Trek fans I know see it as the worthy successor versus any of the shit we've seen. Yes, it is. It's the Star Trek we should have gotten, basically. That's what I said. Jack said it, too. Jack <laughs> I know Jack said it because I think Jack and I had <laughs> that conversation. <laughs> Jack said it early on with me. We were both in agreement with that. That was one of the things we agreed upon when we started being our friends thing. So, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I'm going to be good. I, I'm taking my face off because I'm trying to find my damn vape. It dropped off my. Oh, okay. It dropped off my table now. I'm trying to find it. Mm. But yeah. <laughs> Horrible. So, what, what got. So, what really gravitated you guys? So, let's let's kind of go into the Oroville here and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. What gravitated us towards Oroville? Uh, with you, Alicia, me, and then Jack, and then Jack, you uh, take over uh, for what you want to talk about and how you want to do this. But Alicia, what really gravitated, what grabbed you to Oroville and made you feel that this was really the Star Trek we had been wanting? Because we had already had STD out and none of us were happy. Okay, so I was hooked on very early on from the pilot episode, basically old wounds. So basically what gravitated was especially toward that end in scene. So basically when they're with the krill and <laughs> they glued the little acorn kind of seed on top of the device and basically it explodes and turns into a giant tree and destroys their whole spacecraft kind of thing. That. I love that. And then it was it was more so it grew with the music, the storytelling. Um, you take care of me, Dan. Hi. I always liked it. Uh, <coughs> happy Arbor Day. What is Arbor Day? Yes. Uh, what exactly. was said? You got wood? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's better. Yes, exactly. But I mean, I loved it. I really did. I mean, I, it was, I mean, I was. I loved it. I was hooked in into it. I was like, okay, I love the storytelling, the music, and then the CGI effects. It all merged together perfectly. Well, what I read was they do uh, kind of a combination when you get like the undersides and certain things, those are practical effects. But when mm -hmm. you get some of the, the more intense scenes they have, they do CGI for them. But they managed to do them very well to where it's difficult to see and you know, we've seen a lot of budgets where we've seen cheap CGI mm -hmm. and cheap practical effects, and it's just, it's garbage. And it's nice to see a show that when they do, because it, it's kind of interesting the way they do that, you know, the overshots, whether it's the underbelly of it or yes. the top of it, that really harkens back to what it would be like when you saw the ship in yep. Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Pure and simple. I mean, the music tells it great. The special effects. I mean, I've spoken to several of the visual effects team. Brandon Fayette, Brooke Nasca, and 
my hats off to them. Honestly, I love what they do. They really do an awesome job. And then the music, the acting, it just, it's the great, it's the right combination of everything. And you can tell that Seth MacFarlane has respect for the cast and crew and the fans to not disrespect them, to show them some quality. Think about how many Star Trek alumni we've had on there. I mean, we've got the doctor who was Cassidy Yates. Mm-hmm. From DS9, yep. Yep. Yep, we got Robert Picardo. We've got Tim Russ. We've had Robert Duncan McNeil directing episodes. We've had Jonathan Frakes directing episodes. We've had Marina Sirtis. Uh, we've had John Billingsley. Oh, my word. There's, yeah. It just, on and on. I, I think for as much as these Star Trek alumni are trying to stay on the good side of Paramount because, you know, you got convention stuff. Let's mm -hmm. be honest. Probably most of them behind the behind the scenes are like, damn, it's much more fun to be on Oroville. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, when, when you think about it, it is a very interesting way to do a show, start off the bat. Um, the way they did it, it was... Like I said, it, it kind of had that little, what maybe would have thought it was gratuitous humor. And I thought, I think this is just a play. I think he's just trying to do some visual humor. But then it goes into more subtle humor. Like, for example, when Ed, you know, he's kind of alone. He wants to hang out, you know, when it when it comes to the latch clap. And oh. you know, he goes and sees Lamar, and Lamar is... You know, with a chick half over and she smoked. And let's be honest, she was smoking a joint. We know she's he's like, Do you want to join it? He's like, he's like I mean, come on, any one of us would have been that way. But I'm like, no, I'm about to get I'm about to get it on. <laughs> they were getting high, they were about to get it on. Yeah, that's why he's like he's like, Nope, uh see you later, Captain. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey, no, cap, come on. <laughs> Don't pull that rank shit on me. <laughs> and of course he knew better. But yes. there were so many, there was so there's such wonderful uh you know callbacks to the idea of Star Trek without them being so you know, I think Seth MacFarlane really understands how to do allegories and what I call Easter eggs because I use the term, you know, we use the term Easter eggs and member berries. The thing yes. is Easter eggs are things you don't notice necessarily, but when you find out about them, you're surprised. Member berries are like literally what uh, Jack and I were talking about with uh, Lower Decks. It's just like, oh, let's just throw the shit in your face and say, hey, we remember this stuff, so you should like us. Yeah, which is stupid, really. I mean, I see the Easter eggs. So I do see those Easter eggs. That's one of the things I pointed out a couple of times. I said, there's a bunch of Easter eggs, and people go like, really? And I'm like, yeah, because I have a podcast. I do message boards. I do it all with I Marvel. Have well, think about this. They did an amazing episode, I thought, with Bordis, you know, uh, porn addiction. Oh, you know, yes. Yeah, I mean, that was a really good episode because, you know, take modern time. Is he really cheating? I mean, how do you define that in, in that would be a modern way of maybe doing porn, in a sense? And... You know, he has his reasons why, because of what happened with um, what happened with their son, daughter. Yes, yes, the, the child, yes. Yes, daughter. which was a great episode because I really felt that that was another thing. He took an allegory, which was, you know, the whole thing about transgenderism and the judgment on it and turned it on its head. Which was very reminiscent to Star Trek especially the next generation when it was the entire, I don't remember the name of the episode, but remember Riker falls in love with that, uh, that one non-binary person. I mean, I would call her non-binary because they have no gender, but she identifies as female. And the whole point of her society is no, nobody has a gender. Everybody is happier this way. And it really had some perils to what happened in uh, that episode. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, that was very early on. I was like, okay, not everything is going to end happily, or there are going to be consequences to it. Which I was glad Bordis, you know, I was glad they they went on with that in 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 some ways. Is Bordis has not handled this, you know, in in a way that 
you know, next episode, okay, nothing, nothing matters. It doesn't matter. It was an episode. It's over. No, this had consequences mm -hmm. between him and his mate. Yes. And that was a thing we saw in, you know, Star Trek, you know, things had weight. It wasn't always, even though they were episodic, there were still shades of things that would transition through the series. It didn't have to be serialized to remember that eight things happened. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, we're hitting the 41 minute mark. All right, Jack, what do you got? We want to okay. talk So, I mean, you, you talked about how much depth there is in, in Star Trek and in, in the Orville and everything. So, the reason why is because I believe the creators have life real life experiences and uh they understand dire consequences and stuff like that unlike you know this new generation and so what i want to talk about i, I want to go all the way back i want to go all the way back to, like to i want to tell you about gene roddenberry's life before, yeah, go ahead. before he made star trek and i'm also going to uh, throw in a couple of the other ones uh i'll talk a little bit about james duhan uh mm -hmm. because Another he had a hero. He Another had a, hero. yeah, he had a, a lot of life experience before acting too. He was a war so, hero too. Him like Gene Roddenberry, they were both war heroes. Yes. And that's what I, part of what I want to talk about. Um, so Gene Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry was born in El Paso, Texas in 1921. His family moved to Los Angeles in 1923, where his dad became a, a cop. Uh, James Duhon joined the uh, Royal Canadian Artillery in 1938 uh, while Gene Roddenberry was a kid growing up. Uh, Gene wanted to be a cop too, so he f at first majored in police sciences when he went to college, but quickly became interested in aeronautical engineering and earned a civilian pilot's license. Uh, he then joined the, um, he joined the United States uh, Army Air Corps, which would later become the Air Force, 11 days after the Pearl Harbor attack uh, in 1942. And so by the age of 21, he was already commissioned as a second lieutenant. Um, in 1943, uh, he crashed a bomber into trees after it missed the runway. His navigator and his bombardier were killed. Um, so he spent the rest of his military career as a plane crash investigator. So he would he would uh, fly to various plane crashes and investigate them. Uh, and then at one point, he ended up surviving a second plane crash as a passenger. Wow. So 1943, he's already survived two plane crashes. I mean, I figure surviving one plane crash is, is you know, that, that would be enough experience in there. I've never survived a plane crash, so, you know. <laughs> um, so while that was, so, so while he was doing that, uh, in 1944, James Duhon was actually involved in D-Day. Um, he actually, he landed in Juneau Beach, and he ended up getting shot six times, uh, um, including, including his right middle finger, which would later be amputated. And yep. if you watch... Start if you watch the original series, he hide he tries to hide that. Um, he tries to hide that a lot, but yeah, so he got shot six times, he survived. Um, so meanwhile, in 1945, after the war ended, Gene left the military and began flying for Pan Am. And in 1947, he experienced a third plane crash, and there's actually a lot more detail about this one. Um, so he was acting as third officer and he took over for, uh, a captain about the captain, about five hours into the flight. And while that happened, an engine went out, but he and the captain decided to keep flying to the destination Istanbul because the plane could still fly on three engines. Why Istanbul and not Constantinople? Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I'm... I'm, I don't want to get into that. That's a whole nother history. Anyways. Um, I guess we so, need to ask the Turks. Yeah. So so he, they were going to Istanbul. They're, they're, they were going on three engines now. And those three engines started to overheat. 
and one of them caught fire. So suddenly the plane was going to go down. And so as it started going down, Gene went to reassure the passengers because this is a commercial flight and, and reiterated like crash procedures and stuff. So there was 36 people on that plane. 15 people were killed. Ooh. Roddenberry, who was the only uh, surviving flight officer, sur uh, suffered two broken ribs. Mm -hmm. But he was able to help survivors out of the plane uh, as it began to burn. Uh, the, talk about drama here. The last person he pulled out ended up dying in his arms. Oh, no. So all those scenes, the Star Trek scenes where somebody dies in Kirk's arms, I'll have, like just go through my head. Um <laughs> He then he then led the survivors on a four mile trek, trek get it, uh, to a nearby town where he was able to call for help. Uh, he resigned from Panem in 1948 and returned to Los Angeles, and uh, that's where he became uh, an LA cop. He did he did the traffic beat for about a year and a half, and then and then became the chief of police's speechwriter because he can write. Uh, during that time, he also became a technical advisor and writer for a show called Mr. District Attorney, which is the beginning of his entertainment career. Meanwhile, while that was going on, in 1953, Leonard Nimoy joined the U.S. Army Reserve and left in 1955 as a staff sergeant. So he has a military experience, too. But, of course, he was younger, so it was after the war. Um, well, 53 I, is close to the right around the time of Korea. True. That's that's a good point, actually. Yeah. Um, by 1956, Gene Roddenberry resigned from the police department to focus on writing scripts. And so he wrote scripts for a number of TV shows and would often pitch his own ideas for a TV series. Uh, he was then asked to write a series called Riverboat, but he was fired from that when he argued with the producers about the lack of black people on the show. Yeah, so like... You know, they didn't want, they didn't want to deal with that, I guess. <clears throat> so his first pilot, the one, the first one that actually uh, was picked up or not picked up, but the first pilot he was able to do was called the wild blue, but it wasn't picked up for a series. Mm. But two of the main characters of that pilot were named Philip Pike and Edward Jellicoe. <laughs> no yeah, so it, but it wasn't picked up, so like he reused the names, I guess, later on. Um, the second pilot he was able to do was called 333 Montgomery. It also wasn't picked up, but the main character was a lawyer that was played by DeForest Kelly. Okay. <laughs> um, he also received a letter from an actress who wanted to meet with him. That was not, that, that became Nigel Barrett. Uh, they quickly became friends and eventually had an affair and married and blah, 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 blah. Uh, 1961, after watching Masters of the World, Gene had this idea for a multi-ethnic crew on an airship that would travel the world. But then he tabled it uh, at, the, at that moment and started working on another pilot called the Lieutenant, where he worked with the likes of uh, Gene L. Kuhn, D.C. Fontana, Leonard Nimoy. And Michelle Oh my goodness. There's a name. Mm -hmm. so, so this is where he starts meeting the people that he's going to be working with. Uh, at the same time, getting the idea, you know, refining his idea for the show. So he refines his airship story and made it into a science fiction. He, instead of traveling the world, they would travel through space. And he called it Star Trek. And, mm -hmm. he, and then he... Uh, he took the pitch today. It was like a, it was like a, a thir or it was a sixteen-page, um, uh, like a like idea, like um, draft, draft, whatever. Yeah, it, it was about sixteen pages, and it was a pitch. And he took it to Desi Lou, and by now Desi Arnaz was no longer part of Desi Lou. He sold his half to Lucille Ball, and, and so the she, divorce, yeah, after they got divorced, she got his. She bought him out. Yeah. So, so she actually owned the entire uh, uh, studio. Uh, they were having they financial trouble. In a company. Yeah. And, but the problem was they were having financial trouble. So Ball was looking for other projects to, to pitch to, uh, 
to uh, TV stations. And she was presented with two shows, Mission Impossible and Star Trek. So Ball's board of directors picked up Mission Impossible, but they were really hesitant to pick up Star Trek, which is what you, you mentioned earlier. Ball, she, she actually believed that the show was about a group of traveling USO performers. And so she, <laughs> I remember hearing that. And, and she, so she liked that idea, and so she overruled that board of directors and, um, and, and hired Gene as a producer. And together they took Star Trek to CBS. Who, by the way, CBS now owns Star Trek. Yes. But when CBS was first, uh, you know, pitched it, they passed on it because and they were working. He's the one who produced the cage. Yeah, and so like, yeah, so they um, they passed on it because they were working on Lost in Space. CBS was, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when they took it to NBC he changed his pitch a little bit and that's when he started talking about wagon train through the stars <laughs> and uh nbc act it actually works so nbc asked for a, like three ideas three story ideas and he made his three story ideas and they uh they chose the menagerie which was later called the cage right. and that was that was selected to be the first pilot mm -hmm. so you know then you know he refines his ideas a little more the original name of the ship was going to be the USS Yorktown. Yep. But he changed his mind and renamed it the USS Enterprise after the Yorktown class aircraft carrier CV-6. Uh, so during World War II, this ship, CV-6, the Enterprise, survived the attack on Pearl Harbor and would later fight in the Battle of Midway and would become the most decorated ship in World War II. So that's why Roddenberry chose that, uh, the Enterprise. Smart, and he also and he also wrote in the. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Okay, I'll wait. So he so he also wrote in the uh, the character of number one specifically from Nigel Barrett, and he wrote Spock specifically for Leonard Nimoy. Um, and the cage was filmed between November and December of 1964, but test audiences didn't like it. And the project was almost canceled until the idea of a second pilot was suggested. And you know what? You know what was so interesting was the the character of number one, mm -hmm. a strong female character, was not hated by the men. It was hated by women. They Still. literally, I've I've seen comments where they said, you know, they would like, who does this person think she is talking to a man like that? I'm like, you know, but I I didn't grow up during that time, so I don't know. How that worked? I'm like, I'm missing the problem. <laughs> I don't see a problem with her. I really don't. As a female, I don't. No, I don't either. But I mean, she was. I mean, when we talk, you know, I, I did my, I did my, uh, my stream where I said, you know, people always argue with me that uh, Star Trek is progressive and liberal. I said, yes, it is. It's also conservative. And I did a. I did a stream a while back, a recording, and then I stated all three, why it can be all three, why the Federation of Starfleet can be all three, because I understand these terms quite well. Uh, she was a very strong, powerful woman. I mean, she even, I mean, at the end of the first episode of The Cage, when she, uh, the yeoman goes, who would have been the Eve? And the commander's like, crewman. You know, basically telling her, you are exceeding your post. And, I mean, it was just, uh, you know, uh, a really good first step. Unfortunately, it, it turns out to be a blessing because, unfortunately, Jeffrey Hunter passed away sometime later. Yes. Uh, due to, I think, a house accident, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it was, um, I want to say a Bowdoin accident or something. It was some kind of health issue. I think it was an accident. I don't think it was a health issue. Um, anyway, Jack, continue. All right. So, all right. Yeah. So the, so yeah. So the second pilot was ordered on March of 1965, and that pilot was called uh, "Where No Man Has Gone Before," and Gene made a bunch of changes to the to the you know to the uh, casting and stuff, including a new captain played by William Shatner, Captain James T. Kirk, a new doctor played by DeForest Kelly. Uh, an engineer played by James Tuhan. You got Sulu played by George Takei. And then you have Uhura played by Michelle Nichols. 
Nigel Barrett went from playing number one to playing Nurse Chapel. Yeah, and I remember him wanting her in it. She dyed her hair, and he didn't even recognize it. And I remember seeing newsreel where they talked about, if I can fool Eugene, I can fool the executives. <laughs> well, that, that well, that's what they did. Um, that's actually what happened because this time NBC agreed to order the series. And so season one of Star Trek was shot at Soundstage 31. Yeah, Soundstage is 31 and 32 of Desilu Studios, which was originally built for RKO Pictures. Um, the uh, design of the Enterprise and its interiors was done by a guy named Matt Jeffries. And he was uh, later... Is, what, are, what are those tubes called? Well, that's exactly what I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead and say it. What are those tubes called? Uh, they're called Jeffries tubes. Yes. Yeah, so the first episode that was aired uh, was The Man Trap, despite the pilot being a different episode. It was aired in the September 8th, 1966 on NBC, and the reviews were mixed. And um, um, by season two, they decided to add Walter Koenig as Pavel Chekhov to appeal to the youth. And they gave him like this like monkeys looking wig. Mm -hmm. uh, and at first, uh, when he first came in, George Takei and him shared a dressing room. And mm -hmm. Takei was suspicious that he was going to replace him. And so at first, like, they were kind of, he was kind of rough on him a little bit. He was kind of, like, shitty for, to him. And then he later on, like, realized, that, okay, like, we're, we're all working together. So he apologized and we became friends. Um, by season two, um, but the, the, se the ratings were still declining. And so the network was starting to contemplate cancellation. Gene, of course, didn't want this, so he started a secret letter writing campaign which grew into like small protests. Like people would actually go to the studio with picket signs. And this eventually saved the show for one last season. But the third season, it like, it, it suffered a price. Uh, it suffered a budget cut, which is part of the reason why the quality went down. Um, a bad time slot. Friday which would, night death slot. Yeah. And reduced involvement from Gene because he had gotten so tired of arguing with the execs and stuff like that. Uh, he had mostly pulled out, uh, you know, he had mostly pulled out it except for like small parts. And he was still executive producer, but he didn't, he wasn't as involved as he was anymore. He was, he was like tired of it. So during that season, season three, they were able to get away with airing one of the one of the uh, earliest biracial kisses in TV history, when Nichelle Nichols and William Shatner were forced to kiss. The executives, and I, and I, the only, um, the only kind of, that was the first interracial American kiss. I believe the first actual interracial kiss happened on a British show a little bit prior, but it's lesser known. If I remember my history. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, uh, yeah, that's why I say one of the earliest and not the first. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So when the executives learned about this scene, they wanted to film it a, a different version of the scene. They wanted to film a version of the kiss where you don't actually see it happening on screen. Right. So they actually visited the set to supervise this. Um, so... They they wanted to they so they filmed like one scene where they actually kissed on screen, and then an, another cut where they kind of go off screen. Yeah. And um, so they filmed both versions, but what the executives didn't see and they didn't know it until the film was processed was that when in the uh, the scene where they're off screen when we, William Shatner goes back on screen, he crosses his eyes. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, because of this, the executives were forced to use the cut with the on-screen kiss. <laughs> Smart. Yeah. I think a lot of people sometimes forget how good of an actor William Shatner really is. Yeah. I mean, we, we had, uh, guys, we're coming up. We're, we're hitting over an hour here, so we're going to have to pick this up next time uh, in the future. But uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, one more, one more fact. Yeah, NBC, go ahead. I'm just saying we're we're hitting that hour mark. Yeah, NBC finally canceled Star Trek February of 1969 after 79 episodes. And then we got the TAS, which went for a couple seasons. And you know, I yeah, and then of course you get the uh the that's what we should talk about next time. How syndication really saves Star Trek's future. I mean, Lucille Ball is the reason why the groundwork of but something about that syndication is what made Star Trek so popular that it continued afterwards. I mean, when you think about Star Trek. It's one of those few uh, series where things really resonate with you. But not only that, you remember the name of the title of the episode. I mean, you think about the, the, the probably thousands upon thousands of shows we've watched with titles. But, we, you know, if I say The Man Trap, people know what I'm talking about. If I say In the Pale Moonlight, if I say Best of Both Worlds. Mm-hmm. You know what? You know exactly what episode I'm talking about. Uh, Turnabout Intruder being the last episode in Star Trek, uh, the original series. Um, Balance of Terror, Doomsday Machine, uh, In the Pale Moonlight, Paper Moon. I mean, th- these these had in a way, even all the way back then, to even though that gap they had, they managed to really still find the spirit of what Star Trek was and give you new purpose to it. Whereas this garbage now, they, I don't care. These people have no clue what Star Trek is. True. Seth MacFarlane understands Star Trek because he's doing, he's like, hey, I understand Star Trek. I understand what people want in Star Trek. I'm just going to inject a little bit of my own humor in it. And show, but not to make, like when we, uh, what was that movie called with uh, the guy from uh, Tool Time? Tim Allen, Galaxy Tim Quest. Allen. Yeah, Galaxy Quest. Mm-hmm. Galaxy Quest was seen as kind of a parody where I disagreed. It was more of a love letter, kind of a fun love letter to fans and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, this, which... I don't feel as a parody. I just feel it's a lo- Orville is a love letter. Orville is what we wanted for a long time in an idea of Star Trek. And I think that's why when Jack and I were talking uh, about Lower Decks, it's like, Lower Decks is trying to be Orville and they're fucking sucking at it. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, folks. So that is our initial talk on history of film, Star Trek. Uh, what do you guys want to talk about next week? You want to do Star Trek? You want? Hey, I got a great idea. Actually, I want to say this. Let's see. Uh, let me check the timeline here. Do you guys want to have a a uh, a stream on the twenty sixth, the day after Christmas, or do you sure. want to wait until? Okay. Um, I would like to kind of go over uh, history of film, classic Christmas movies, uh, and. What you know? What some of those meant, and why they're so timeless. I mean, we can go anywhere from "It's a Wonderful Life" to um, "Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street." Thirty Fourth Street. Thank you. Uh, to Rudolph, to the Santa Claus is coming to, especially those stop motion animation stuff. Because I mean, you really think about it when you watch them. You now, you know, Mister Grinch and stuff. You know, these things are still timeless and that's why i was saying you know when we look at film and we look at you know any of it there are some things that are their movies their tv series and there are just some things that transcend beyond that does that make sense yep all right folks i hope you all enjoyed uh jack uh alicia do you guys have anything coming up this week nope nope Uh All right, everyone, you have a blessed one. Merry Christmas. Peace and long life.